Okay. And happy Sabbath to today the, for those of you on the uh, United States that are um, with us visiting. And let's bow our heads for prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you that we can come together across the world and look at your truths. Look at your truths within the Bible and in the spirit of prophecy regarding courtship and marriage. I ask that your Holy Spirit be with each and every person uh, as we are here today and be with us, be with me as I'm speaking and let the Father, I thank you for every person and ask your Holy Spirit for with you, my words do not affect And I pray that all this welcome everyone, and I will just um other is that a come and speak to you on the subject of courtship and marriage. And uh, for those of you who do not know me, my name is Allison Stevens. What does that mean? And what that is, is uh, several years ago, the Lord called us into doing publishing work for him full time after. And that involves remnant EDU. What that means is educating God's remnant people. And so that's why we came up with remnant EDU. Um, it includes things like republishing the original works of the spirit of prophecy. Uh, we do a lot of research with the spirit of prophecy and looking at original manuscripts, comparing them against current manuscripts uh, or books. And then we also do a lot of teaching um, from what we're learning. And so I hold uh, four Zoom sessions per week online. And for anyone who wants to join in, you're welcome to do that. Just contact me on my Facebook page. And so anyway, we've covered a, I've covered a lot of topics, but this one is very, so important, marriage and counsels on courtship. So I apologize. I was not able to be here last night. Um, because my husband has been going through some health situations, but praise the Lord. And I thank everybody for their prayers. He is doing better. So please continue praying. Um, the Lord will heal him in this, this situation. But so I had four presentations. I'm going to do the first one today. The second two, I'm going to do tomorrow. I'm going to combine them together. And then the a fourth one I will do on Sunday. So what are we going to talk about here? What, what is the uh, intent? So the first lecture we're going to talk about is God's ideal for marriage and counsels on courtship. So, and primarily what I'm using for my sources are the vast majority is scripture and spirit of prophecy. I don't quote from psychologists or anything like that. Um, Bible and Spirit of Prophecy, and I might add in some of my own, um, maybe testimonies or so forth. Uh, second day, we're going to be, tomorrow, we're going to be looking at uh, two things, preparing yourself for marriage. And as you really think about it, there's a lot of preparation that needs to be done. So we'll talk about that. We're gonna be talking also about um, spiritual preparation. And so for those of you who are married and been married for quite a while, hopefully this will be some information you maybe have never heard before, uh, as we have found it in our studies of the spirit of prophecy. So tomorrow I'll include that preparation for oneself for marriage. And then also we'll talk about compatibility issues tomorrow. And then on Sunday, 
we're going to talk about help for difficult marriages. And uh, I think everyone who's been married will attest to the fact that uh, things are not always perfect, but there is a lot of help and there's a lot of guidance given to us through the spirit of prophecy. And I'll be also sharing with you some very interesting letters be that have come out through the spirit of prophecy, things that have never been uh, published before that is now available to us. And uh, I'll try to also give you quotes. When I give you quotes, I will try to tell you where they come from as well. I think I have most of them here. But anyway, so let's get back and let's, let's get started. And first of all, I want to start out with some scripture. You know, there's a lot of uh, Bible texts regarding God's ideal for marriage. I have two pages of them. I have scriptures for men and for women. I might just type these up and post them on my Facebook page because there's so many. But um, just a couple that I want to talk about. I want to mention here first is if you have your Bibles, if you'll turn with me to starting with the, uh, Proverbs chapter 31 and uh, verses 10 through 31. So Proverbs 31 verses 10 through 31. And as I read, um, I do something, I kind of switch back my camera angles here, um, back and forth. And I have a screen and I have a, a document camera. I'm gonna share, actually share my Bible with you so that you can see it in case you don't have yours with you. So let me get that here. All right. Here we go. All right. Proverbs 31 verses 10 through 31. Who can find? Let me put this down so that you can see it a little bit better because it's better that way. Let's see. Who can find a virtuous woman? For her price is far beyond above rubies. The heart of her husband doth safely trust in her, so that he shall have no need of spoil. She will do him good and not evil all the days of her life. She seeketh wool and flax and worketh willingly with her hands. She is like a merchant's ships. She bringeth her food from afar. She riseth also when it is yet night and giveth meat to her household and a portion to her maidens. She considereth a field and buyeth it. And with the fruit of her hands, she planteth a vineyard. Let me go back over here. She girdeth her loins with strength and, re and strengtheneth her arms. She perceiveth that her merchandise is good. Her candle goeth not out by night. She layeth her hands to the spindle and her hands hold off the distaff. She stretcheth out her hand to the poor. Yea, she reacheth forth her hands to the needy. She is not afraid of the snow for her household, for all her household are clothed with scarlet. She maketh herself coverings of tapestry. Her clothing is silk and purple. Her husband is known in the gates when he sitteth among the elders of the land. She maketh fine linen and selleth it and delivereth girdles unto the merchant. Strength and honor are her clothing. Look at that. Strength and honor are her clothing. And she shall rejoice in time to come. I'm just admitting somebody here. Uh, she opened her mouth with wisdom, and in her tongue is the law of kindness. She looketh well to the ways of her household, and eateth not the bread of idleness. Eateth not the bread of idleness. Her children arise up and calleth her blessed, her husband also, and he praiseth her. Many daughters have done virtuously, but thou excellest them all. Favor is deceitful, beauty is vain. But a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. Give her the fruit of her hands and let her own works praise her in the gates. Ladies, we have a tall order ahead of us for being mothers and wives. 
And let's also look over at Ephesians 5, 22 and 23, and actually 20 to 25. Here is the duties of the home relationship. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is a savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject to Christ, so let wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. And jumping down here to verse 33, nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. You know, as I look at this um, verse here, I was talking to a dear friend of mine. She might be listening, I don't know. But uh, she just told me this week, she was sharing with me some experiences that she had. And she said that there was a, uh, there was a study that was done on what wives are looking for in a marriage when there's, when there's conflict and what the husbands are looking for and in a conflict. And they said overwhelmingly, and this was, now this was a secular study, but overwhelmingly what the wives, when there was a conflict, the wives were looking to be loved. And in that same conflict, the husbands were looking to be respected. And here we have from the Bible, nevertheless, let every one of you, in particular, so love his wife, even as his self, even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. So again, once again, we see a secular study that's been done, and it confirms what the Bible says. So when there's a conflict, that's something good for both parties to be aware of. But let's look some more at God's purpose and ideal for marriage. And as I was doing pre preparing for these studies, the one thing I came away with is I thought, boy, I just, I wish I'd had this information when I was young. So I pray that, I know this is being recorded. I know it's going out on, on Facebook Live. And so I just pray that this is a blessing to all and for young people and for all ages to listen to this council. This council is coming from, initially I'm going to be talking from Ministry of Healing and also uh, testimonies. So God's purpose and ideal for marriage. This is from Ministry of Healing, page 356. And, uh, but first of all, let me just show you a graphic here. I'll just switch this over here. Um, I, I like this picture, so I included it in my notes. It says, God, this is from Testimonies, Volume 6. God designs that the family of earth shall be a symbol of the family in heaven. Christian homes established and conducted in accordance with God's plan are among his most effective agencies for the formation of Christian character and the advancement of his work. And notice this here, for the formation of Christian character. Character, we're going to talk about a lot in our lecture series here. Character is the one thing that is so important for each one of us, not only in our relationships and in our marriages, but also for eternity. And this all involves sanctification, the development and the transformation of our character, being restored back to the way that God intended for a man to be before sin was in the world. And also think about this, our characters have to be returned back to that state because when we go to heaven, we will be living with sinless beings. And so there will be no trace of sin or deeply rooted motives of any kind of sinful nature in us. So this character transformation is something that needs to be going on daily now in every single one of us. And especially for people who are considering marriage 
to be very well aware of it because character is going to affect your entire lives. And you know what is, and that is sanctification is the transition changing of your character to be holy. And that, and that sanctification doesn't happen overnight. It, it is a work of a lifetime. So let's, let's go on here. Man was not made to dwell in solitude. He was to be a social being. You remember when Adam and Eve were created, you know, Adam looked around, all the animals had a, had a partner, but Adam didn't have one. And so God created Eve. Without companionship, the beautiful scenes and the delightful employments of Eden would have failed to yield perfect happiness. Can you imagine Adam just wandering around by himself? Even communion with angels could not have satisfied his desire for sympathy and companionship. There was none of the same nature to love and to be loved. So God himself gave Adam a companion. He provided a helpmeet for him, a helper corresponding to him, one who was fitted to be his companion and one who could be with him in love and sympathy. So E was created, taken from the side of Adam, signifying that she was not to control him as the head, nor to be trampled under his feet as an inferior, but to stand by his side as an equal to be loved and to be protected by him. A part of man, bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh, Eve was his second self, showing the close union and affectionate attachment that could exist in this relationship. Ephesians 5.29 says, For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth it and cherisheth it. Genesis 2.24 says, Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and cleave unto his wife, that they shall be one flesh. Jesus, who gave Eve to Adam as a helpmeet, performed his first miracle at the marriage festival. In the festival hall where friends and kindred rejoiced together, Jesus began his public ministry. Thus, he sanctioned marriage instituting it as an institution that he himself had established. He ordained that men and women should be united in holy wedlock to rear families whose members crowned with honor should be recognized as members of the family above, members of the heavenly family. Marriage is honorable, Hebrews 13, 4. And it was one of the first gifts to man and it is one of the two institutions that after the fall, Adam brought with him beyond the gates of paradise. Does anybody know what the other institution was? And you're welcome to respond if I ask questions because I'm used to kind of used to that. Sabbath. The Sabbath, yes, absolutely. Marriage and the Sabbath kind of shows you how important both of those, both of those are. In Letters to Young Lovers, it says on page 11, when the divine principles are recognized and obeyed in this relation, marriage is a blessing. It guards the purity and happiness of the race. It provides for man's social needs. It elevates the physical, the intellectual, and the moral nature. Christ also honored the marriage relation by making it a symbol of the union between him, between him and his redeemed ones. In fact, when you think about the uh, parable of the 10 virgins, that was all centered around a parable of a marriage, a marriage that was about to happen, and a, a marriage that was waiting to occur. In Song of Solomon 4, 7, it says, he himself is the bridegroom. The bride is the church, of which as his chosen one, he says, thou art all fair, my love. There is no spot in thee. Now you might say, what does that mean? No spot in thee. It means it's a pure character. And that means, what does that mean for us? That is talking about us becoming sanctified, getting 
becoming going through the uh, getting that white raiment that is talked about in for the council to the Laodiceans in uh, Revelation 318. So there's a lot as the as the more you study the Bible and the more you study the spirit of prophecy, especially the spirit of prophecy, you're going to find how the Bible and the spirit of prophecy uh, complement each other and explain things to such a deeper level that you've never seen before and heard before. So Christ loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify it, that means to, clean, to make it holy, and cleanse it, that it should be holy and without blemish. And that is what we are supposed to be going through, is get, having a purification of ourselves. So ought men to love their wives, Ephesians 5, we just read that, 5 through 28, Ephesians chapter 5, verses 25 through 28. You know, the, the family tie is the closest, most tender, and sacred of any on earth. It was designed to be a blessing to mankind. And it is a blessing wherever the marriage covenant is entered into intelligently. That means not hastily. That means with lots of prayer, lots of thought, lots of counsel in the fear of God and with due consideration for the marriage responsibilities. And we'll be talking about that some more. Things that need to be considered before we say, I do. In both the Old and New Testament, the marriage relation is employed to represent the tender and sacred union that exists between Christ and his people, the redeemed ones that he purchased at the cost of Calvary. And when you think about that, he purchased at the cost of Calvary. We are not uh, just free to do what we want. Christ has a claim on each one of us. Our lot in life is not to just, you know, um, after we're born, grow up and just pursue whatever we want to do and go to church once a week or whatever and just continue on. But everything that we do, the Lord has a, has a, has a claim on us. I mean, he purchased us at the cost of Calvary, at his own, of his own life. Therefore, we have a huge obligation back to him and to um, work with him so that we can be restored back to the way we were supposed to be before sin came into the world. It is only in Christ, only, that a marriage alliance can be safely formed. That's true. When you look at all, and even, and even marriages in the church, um, with when you think you're marrying somebody of a of the like same faith, that's no guarantee. Just because somebody has a, you know, they are on the church books, been baptized on the church books, that still doesn't guarantee a successful marriage. There's much more that goes into it. But still, it is only in Christ that a marriage alliance can be safely formed. Human love should draw its closest bonds from divine love. Only where Christ reigns can there be true, deep, unselfish affection. Love is a precious gift which we receive from Jesus. And pure and holy affection is not a feeling, but it's a principle. It doesn't just, doesn't just happen based on my feelings as of right now. Love is not something that's, that is just based on how I feel right now. It's a, it's a principle. Those who are actuated by true love are neither unreasonable nor blind. Taught by the Holy Spirit, they love God supremely and their neighbor as themselves. Have you heard it said, if you read, if you read the uh, very first testimonies that Mrs. White wrote, they started coming out around 1843, 44. And one of the very first things that the angel that was with her said to her is that you are your brother's keeper. 
Uh, she says, in fact, when you read the originals, you can get the original testimonies online. And I highly encourage people to read the original testimonies. They are scanned in um, and you can find them on archive.org and in different places, especially archive.org. Um, but read those original ones because they're, there's a different experience as you read the original ones. But it did say, the angel said, you are your brother's keeper. We're not supposed to just be concerned about our own welfare, but those around us. And as you are converted, you will have that. That will happen. You will be more concerned about the salvation of those all around you and the ones that you can reach out to more than even your own personal desires. And so we are our brother's keeper. So let's take a look at this. Now, this is where you might want to take some notes if you can. I just highlight, I'm going to touch on some key points here. S seek God first and always. Let's look at um, Matthew 6, 33. Um, and let me just ask, let's see. Thomas, are you there? Could you help me out here for a couple of verses? Um, I'm going to look up Matthew 6, 33. But Thomas, if you could just have ready James 1, 5, and 6. That's James 1, 5, and 6. And uh, Revelation 3, 18, and 19. And I'm going to look at Matthew 6, 33 here really quick. For those of you who don't know Thomas, he is uh, one of the dear friends of mine that comes to um, all of our Zoom meetings. He's from the United States here. Let's see, Matthew 6.33. I'm going to read first. And we'll see what that says here. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. So what do we do first? Seek ye first, first, the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And then what happens? And all these things shall be added unto you. So... The marriage, the decision to get married, the consideration of going to look for a, a, a spouse or somebody to court, the first thing that should happen before that is seek first the kingdom of God. Because when you get to the point where you are ready to court somebody seriously and you're prepared, the, mo the best thing, you wanna, you wanna come with the best thing you have available possible and the best thing you can do is seek God and what he wants for your life. Learn of him, experience him, um, get practical examples and, and uh, study the word because the more that you can do that, you're building by, by doing that for yourself, you are building one half of that solid foundation for a marriage um, alliance with the future spouse. Let's look at uh, James 1, 5, and 6. Do you have that, Thomas? He didn't know I was going to ask him to do this. Um, if we could read that. And I have it here, too, if he doesn't have it. Um, James 1, 5, and 6. So this is something else we should be praying for. Uh, let patience have her perfect work that, wait a minute, yeah, I'm sorry, no, five and six. If any one of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to men all, giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. So what is that saying? If any of you lack wisdom, you might think, well, I, I, I don't lack wisdom. I have good wisdom. You know what? This is something we should all pray for daily. We can never have enough wisdom. Oh, okay. Thomas can't can't uh, share because he's muted. Okay, I'm sorry, Thomas. Okay, let me just continue. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. So, what are we saying again? If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. That asks, that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. 
but let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. Don't waver when you ask. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea driven with a wind at tossed. So ask in faith and don't waver. And, pre and the other thing too, I'll just tell you from, from one of the first testimonies, uh, the, the angel told Mrs. White, and she wrote this down, I'm kind of thinking, seeing it in my mind's eye. And uh, the angel said to keep pressing the Lord for answers. She sees the angel told her, you give up too easily. Keep pressing the Lord for your answers for even if, you know, because I, and I used to think about that. I thought, well, you know, if I just pray once, isn't that good enough? Doesn't the Lord hear me? You know, he has perfect hearing. But no, we're supposed to keep pressing our petitions to the Lord so that, and, and he will answer. And can you imagine all the prayers going up right now anyway? There's so many, but keep pressing. Don't give up in your prayers. Okay, let's look over at um, Revelation 3, 18 and 19. So book of Revelation, the chapters, Revelation 2 and 3, what should that pop into your mind as being? Revelation 2 and 3 are the chapters about the seven churches. And as I'm turning to it in my Bible, I will just casually mention, if you've never studied the, the seven churches of Revelation, I highly encourage you to do so. Mrs. White tells us, you know, we're told that we're in the, in the time of the Laodicea period, which is true. However, she tells us in Spirit of Prophecy that we are supposed to be studying each one of the seven churches because there are principles that apply to us today. And we just got done going through a series on the seven churches, and it's absolutely true. So don't just, don't just think to focus on Church of Laodicea, but, but, fo but study each one of those, uh, which, each one of those churches. So Revelation 3, verses 18 and 19. Um, this is in the, this is for the Council of Laodicea. And I'm bringing this up because this is very, so very important. It's the Council to the Laodiceans. Mrs. White says, if we have these three things, we will have abundant admission into heaven. So let me just touch on these briefly because you may not have heard this before. So she's talking to the, to the Laodiceans and she's, and, or she isn't, the Lord is. And it says, I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. You might say, what does this have to do with the marriage relationship? Everything. Everything, because this has to do with your character. So then, thou, so then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Not good. We do not want to be spewing out of God's mouth because why is it because thou sayest i am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked so in this council the lord's telling us the condition of the laodiceans but then he doesn't just leave it there and say okay that's it i'm spewing you out of the mouth he gives us a corrective action which is which i love in the bible and you will also find that when you're studying the spirit of prophecy you will see mrs white point out problems and then she will give a corrective action and that's so important to know because so important to look for because the same spirit that inspired the bible is the same spirit that inspired the spirit of prophecy writings and so it makes sense they're similar. But listen to this. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, three things, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment that thou mayest be, whoops, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thy eyes with eye said that thou mayest see. So let's just look at this briefly. And I'm not going to get into my lecture on Laodiceans. That's, I could do that again later. But three things. First of all, it says, I counsel to thee to buy of me. Now, I don't know about you. I used to always wonder, what does that mean to buy of me? How do I buy of me? Mrs. White explains in the Spirit of Prophecy, buy of me, those words, buy of me, means to be zealous and repent. 
by of me means to be zealous and repent. And if you want the exact location, contact me later and I will try to find that for you. But that's what it means, to be zealous and repent. Now, what does being zealous mean? Being zealous, if you're lukewarm, you're neither hot nor cold. But if you're zealous, are you lukewarm anymore? No, you are You are intense. You are um, maybe not intense, but you are determined. You're passionate. You're earnest about what you're doing. So by of me means to be zealous, earnest about repentance. That's the first thing. And that makes sense because sin separates us from God. So if we haven't repented of our sins, we need to do so because that separates us. We don't want, when we're trying to come to God and we're trying to have our characters changed and be prepared and, and be, be ready for courtship and marriage or trying to improve our marriage, the first thing we want to start with is ourselves. And so this is so important that thou mayest be, that thou may buy of me gold tried in the fire. And I can give you studies on these, each one of these, if you want, like, you can ask me later. Gold tried in the fire has to do with faith and love. Um, that thou mayest be rich. And what else are we supposed to buy of the Lord? White raiment. That is the righteousness of Christ. That is sanctification. And there's so much, and I don't like to just, uh, you know, a lot of these words sound very nice and so forth. And, but you might be thinking, well, Give that to me practically. Um, sanctification is a daily work. And it, it so once you've done that, then surrendering your life, surrendering everything to God. Once you've done into his image. But as long as we're holding back and saying, well, uh, I'll take that part of you, Lord, but uh, this part over here, mm, you know, I still, I, I still want to keep on to that, hold on to that. It's not going to work. We have to have all our, as they say here in the United States, keep all of our eggs in <laughs> the Lord's basket. And that's what surrendering is. So we, so we need to have that white raiment, which is sanctification, an ongoing process of making our, of ourselves becoming holy through Jesus' help and in overcoming sin and refinement of our character. And then the third thing is, I, I salve of him that thou mayest city of Laodicea, uh, which is in the present day Turkey, back then,
Hello, Sister Alison. Uh, it's like uh, we can't get you. I don't know if others can be able to get you. I'm, so not, I'm not sure I know what you mean. Yeah, brother Sami, we hear her. I hear her very well. She's audible. Okay. We, we had lost the, 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 the voice. Oh, <laughs> but, okay. But okay. Back. Let's see. How long did, did you lose me? Um, so I was talking about the the um, the uh, Laodicean that, that we need to get the eye salve, the, uh, the white raiment, and the gold tried in the fire. And I have I have uh, uh, spirit of prophecy studies on each one of those that I can share with you for those who are interested. And but to continue on, I'm going to share with you. Can you hear me now? Can everybody hear me now? Hopefully loud and clear. Okay. Great. I'm going to share with you my notes here on this next section of seeking God first and always. And if you want to take a, I have a document cam here that I use. And if you want to take a picture with your phone or just your computer screen. But um, these are some key points that I was thinking about in, in preparing ourselves. Right here, meekness of character. Hopefully you can see this. I'll make this as clear as I can. Meekness of character. And we'll talk about this some more on Sunday. Meekness of character is of the most value to God. It is worth more than gold, silver, and gemstones. If you want meekness, Jesus was the ultimate example of meekness. And meekness is not weakness. But we'll talk about that. I did a whole lecture on that one one time. Um, fascinating. Meekness is a character God mo values most. And this is everyone who's going to heaven, she says, will have meekness. So we need to learn about that. So maybe just jot that down in your notes as something to do. Remember, we are in the Day of Atonement right now. Since 1844, during the investigative judgment, and if any of you are, uh, I know some people don't believe in the investigative judgment. They don't believe that there is uh, any kind of judgment going on. And, but uh, you only need to look at your first angel's message, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment is come. And then likewise, where is this investigative judgment mentioned? Because I've seen people say on, on Facebook, because I'm on Facebook a lot, they say there's no investigative judgment. Well, if you go over and you look in Daniel, I'll just show you really quick. Daniel chapter 7, verses 9 and 10, you will see about this investigative judgment. So just take a look here. I'll just show you really quick. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. We're talking about the ancient of days that sat down. That's, that is our father in heaven. Thousand thousands ministered unto him and 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. The judgment was set and the books were opened. Right there. Verses nine and 10. That is the judgment. And when does that judgment happen? Daniel eight fourteen. It is right here. It is the cleansing of the sanctuary under 2,300 days. Then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. When you think back about, when you think back about the old, um, in the um, Old Testament about the Hebrews and, and the sanctuary that they had, that God had them build, that day of atonement was a judgment day. And they took it very, very seriously. And I'm bringing this up because now we are in this time period since all of us have been born, since 1844, we've been in this time period. So as you're preparing your, your characters for heaven, which is eternity, of course, and you're preparing yourselves for courtship and marriage, it all fits together. We need the sanctification and we need to be preparing for the seal of God. And this isn't just going to church on Sabbath. Please read Testimonies, Volume 5, the chapter on the seal of God. 
and you will, this will um, make sense to you when you read that. Preparing for the seal of God is some is all to do with sanctification. Okay, we talked about the latest sins. Again, we talked about seven churches. Be sure you study this. So these are on your to-do list. So you might want to take a picture of this here. Always, as you're studying your Bibles, pray for the Holy Spirit to teach you and guide you in your studying and in your reading. There's so many times that um, I used to, I would pick up my Bible and I'd start reading. I'd be sitting there 10 minutes and I realized I'm not getting anything out of it. And I'd think to myself, did you pray first? And I go, okay, I didn't pray. Pray and stop and pray and ask for the Holy Spirit. It's like turning the lights on. So always remember that. Pray for wisdom and understanding. We were just reading from James um, 1, 5, and 6. This is something you may not have ever heard before. This is from the Spirit of Prophecy. Guard your time and use it wisely. The probation time that we are in right now is limited obviously because it's will end here and look we are accountable to god for every minute that we use how do we spend it are we look are we going about our day doing things that are um that are upright honest righteous um holy are we are we taking hours to read books and materials or view videos that are not um, of a Christian character, we are accountable to God for every minute. So I wanted to mention that. What will your heavenly records say about you as you spend your time? The rec angels record everything. Everything we say, everything we do, even right now as you're listening. God, in addition to that, reads our hearts and our motives. And that's why we need to pray for that spiritual ISAV. It's, or the ISA, which is also known as spiritual discernment, it means the same thing. ISA, spiritual discernment, same thing. How will your balance, how will your balance, you know, a balance of two, two scales, how will it look for you today? How will it look for you next week, next month? Will your scale weigh more that your, your focus and your energies are on heavenly things or on earthly things. Matthew 620, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt and where thieves do not break nor steal. Remember, we're not just to be here for ourselves. We are here as God's ambassadors, which if you've, you've, you've accepted Christ, you are an ambassador for Christ. And our job is to, as what we learn from uh, the Bible and spirit of prophecy and, you know, in our, in our spiritual walk, we're to share it with others. And do you realize, and we're all supposed to be involved in evangelism to, to those around us. You don't have to go across the, now with Zoom, it's amazing that we can meet like this and talk like this. This is just a, you know, dream come true. But Think about this. Mrs. White says this in, in uh, the Spirit of Prophecy. The value of a soul, one soul, is worth more than all the riches of the world. So when you're going about your daily day-to-day day -day activities, you're going to the store, you're going to the post office to mail something or, you know, whatever you're doing, and you're thinking, man, I should be talking to somebody. I should, and you see that person standing over there or that person over there. And you think, well, I don't know if they really want to hear what I have to say. They won't listen to me. Remember this. The value of one soul is worth more than all the riches of the world. Satan tries to tell us the opposite. He tries to tell us we're worth nothing and go do harmful things to ourselves and uh, even commit suicide or, or different things like that. Don't forget this. The value of your soul, the value of your friend's soul and think about this as you are dating and as you are courting the value of that person's soul is worth more than all the riches of the world if we have a precious gemstone in our hands and influence we're going to treat it very carefully very kindly um, not destructively think about that as you deal with each other 
Is that another thing? Are you a doer of the word or hearer only? The Bible tells us only the doers are saved. That's in, you're going to find that in James, I believe it is. Are you a doer of the word or a hearer only? We can't just say, I believe and I'm saved. It doesn't work that way. The Lord expects us to work. And there'll be people who will say, but oh, we're not saved by our works. True. Nope, you're not saved by your works. But go look at Revelation 22, 12. You are rewarded by your works. The Lord expects us to work things. If we are an ambassador, if we are his representative, he does expect us to do things, to share the truth, to let our light so shine to the world. The great light you have received, you are responsible to share with others. Have you ever seen a pond, a stagnant pond, or a body of water that's just kind of yucky and nasty? It's not clean. And it's, you know, there's some water coming into it, but there's maybe no outlet. Okay. Our spiritual lives should be like a clear stream of water. I'm just kind of giving you an analogy. Where as we are learning spiritual truths, we need to be giving those out to other people, even like we're doing right now, sharing them so that there is a, and the more that you learn and you share with others, you don't have to be a teacher, you don't have to be a professor or anything like that, you can just share with others. The more that you share with others, the more you will or the more that you learn, the more you're supposed to share with others. And the more that you share, the more the Lord is going to give to you. So just keep this in mind. The light that you receive, you are responsible to share it with others. Again, Matthew 5, 16, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your father, which is in heaven. You be like a clear running stream of light and truth for others. Not a stagnant pond with no outlet. This was something new to me, and uh, it makes it makes sense. So let's look at this. Let's look at the pr purpose of courtship. Okay, I'll just show you. I'll share with you my notes. I don't have slides. We were in the hospital and <laughs> doctor's offices all week, so I don't have beautiful slides. So I'm going to share with you my notes so that you can see them. This is from Avenus Tome. Marriage is something that will influence and affect your life, both in this world and in the world to come. And you might think, well, there's not gonna be any marriage in heaven. So how is it gonna affect the world to come? Well, do you have children? Do you wanna have children? They will hopefully be in heaven and hopefully be with you in heaven. But it all depends on what we're doing here. Marriage will affect us and does affect us in this world and have effects in the world to come. There will be many, sadly, there'll be many children in heaven who will be raised by angels because their parents won't be there. So think about this before you jump into marriage, before you get into marriage, so many things that we have to think about. It's the most important decision you make of your entire life. It cannot be entered into just lightly. A sincere Christian will not advance his plans in this direction without the knowledge that God approves his course. He will not want to choose for himself, but he will feel that God must choose for him. Any time that you are, any time that you are, um, what do you call it? Any time that you are dating somebody, you should be praying about it. Is this person the right person for me, Lord? And I can tell you, um, I did it a fair amount before I ever got married. I prayed a lot. And there were times when I even prayed and said, Lord, if this is not the right relationship I should be in, then please help, help me help it end. And I will tell you, <laughs> there were a couple of times I prayed that and within three hours out of the blue, it was over. I didn't see it coming, but I prayed that prayer and it was something happened and that relationship was over. So God listens very carefully to your prayers. Can't, uh, pray for him, pray with, pray, pray to the Lord, 
for every single person that you even have the remote idea of an interest in uh, that could lead to marriage. Things go step by step. They don't, you know, always jump quickly. But think about that. Pray. Always pray. Because you don't want to be out of God's will. Let's see. Also from Adventist Home, a, a happy or unhappy marriage. If those who are contemplating marriage would not have a miserable, unhappy reflections after marriage, which can happen within a month or, or less, they must make it a subject of serious, earnest reflection now. And hopefully as we go through our lecture, we'll be taught, you know, giving some good ideas of what that means. This step taken unwisely, the step into marriage taken unwisely is one of the most effective means, effective means of what? Effective means, let me show you this here, of ruining, <laughs> ruining the usefulness of young men and women if it's so what so let's say that again what was that again if marriage the step into marriage is taken unwisely it is one of the most effective means to ruin somebody or a couple life becomes a burden or a curse now listen to this ladies and gentlemen no one can so effectually ruin a woman's happiness and usefulness and make life a heart sickening burden as her own husband and no one can do one hundredth part as much to chill the hopes and aspirations of a man to paralyze his energies and re and ruin his influence and his prospects as his own wife we have a tremendous impact on each other once we're married for the good or for the bad it is from the marriage hour that many men and women date their success a failure, success or failure in this life and in their hopes of future life. I wish I could make the youth see and feel their danger, especially the danger of making unhappy marriages. Marriage is something that will influence and affect your whole life, both in this world and the world to come. Again, a sincere Christian will not advance his plans in this direction, but without the knowledge that God approves his course. He will not want to choose for himself, but feel God must choose for him or her. We're not, we are not to please ourselves for Christ pleased not himself. And she goes on to clarify this. She says, I would not be understood to mean that anyone who that is to marry, that anyone is to marry one whom he does not love. That would be sin. This would be sin. But a fancy and emotional nature, may like an infatuation, must not be allowed to lead on to ruin. God requires the whole heart, supreme affections. So don't, the one thing as I was studying all of the things that Mrs. White says about marriage and courtship, which is extensive, is she talks over and over about the dangers of hasty marriages getting married quickly and in fact it was interesting to see how much she wrote about even young people who were wanting to go into ministry work and they would be um trained to go out maybe doing gospel cold portering or whatever they would be trained to do this but as soon as they saw somebody you know the opposite sex they were pairing off and getting married and having kids and that was the end of their work and so she told, she told the leader, she said, now you counsel those young people very, very carefully. Are they there just to find a mate or are they there truly to work for God? She says, because if they're there just to find a mate, you're wasting your money in the training of them. But that was something that was happening all the time back in her day. Also look at this. This is from, this is from manuscript 113, 1894. And I'll just share with you something on the side on the side here. If you are not reading and reading these manuscripts and letters that you can access online from egwwritings.org, um, there are so many there that were never published before. 
that are now available to us to read. And there's so much wisdom there. They were just released in 2015 online. And uh, so understand of all the spirit prophecy books that you have to read, that, and you can get everything online for free. But in addition to that, there is, I would say that much and so much even more that has been released to us online that uh, if you have an inter internet connection, you can read these documents and even print them off. For example, like I have, when you print them off, they kind of look like this. Like this one, we're gonna talk about this one in a bit. Previously unpublished, this letter, there's so much wisdom in these letters. This letter was never available to us until 2015. It's not published in any other book or any other article, but there's tremendous wisdom in here. And I can help you identify things by source and, and subject if you like. Um, I talk to me about later about that to make your research easy, easier. But look at this. Temptations come in court in of courtship and marriage. Everyone will be exposed to temptation. And if youth are not patiently instructed on this point, exercising great caution whom they accept, they will have great trouble in their future life. Their whole life may be changed by allowing their minds to be filled with plans and methods how they may gain their object. Okay, well, what does that mean? That means she's talking about a young man or young woman. They see somebody over there that they want. And, that, and, and it's like their schooling goes out the window. Their work is, you know, not, not work, not being done well. And their whole focus is on how can I get that young lady? How can I get that young man? What do I do? How do I look? What do I say? You know, she says the whole life may be changed by allowing the minds to be filled with plans and methods, how they may gain their object, that person. This interferes with their study and with their progress toward perfection of character and acquisition of knowledge. If there is, if you are completely infatuated with somebody and it's consuming your whole life, that should be a red flag. Something's really wrong there. That is not, um, um, we're not ready for true courtship and marriage yet. The youth are to feel it a positive duty to let this subject alone until they have completed their term of school life. She says this repeatedly, get your education first. Stay in school, get it done. Nobody, you have to invest in yourself. Nobody can take your education away from you. I used to tell my children that over and over and over, get your education, then you have it. Then go on and do, you know, um, look for a marriage partner and so forth. The aim to, to advance constantly learning is to be their aim and purpose. Young men and women will have no danger in binding up their heart affections with Jesus um, to love God with all their might, might, with all their heart, mind, and soul, and strength while in school. So stay in school. If you like people, make friends with all kinds of people. Talk to them. But don't be focusing on you know, courtship and marriage while you're in school and then you get married and they drop out of school and, you know, finish school. So important. This comes from uh, a letter 1886 here, I think. Wait, no, no, no. This next section, um, no, it must be the same one, same one here. One of the greatest errors connected with this subject is that the idea that the young and experienced must not have their affections disturbed, that there must be no interference with this love experience. Mm. Now, I don't know about any of you, but I was, uh, as many people know, I was adopted and I was adopted by a um, Adventist uh, couple that were, they'd already raised five boys. And so I was the youngest. And so my mom was, my mom and dad were, boy, what were they? They were in their late forties, almost 50 when they adopted me. And I will tell you that they had no problem disturbing <laughs> if I had a crush on somebody. 
and and it's and I did not like it, as you can imagine. But you know what? I am so thankful. I am so thankful that when they saw me, you know, getting attentions from somebody or or whatever, you know, a relationship starting, and they were watching to see who I was with and who I was paying attention with, and they, in their wisdom, they could see where that might be going. And when they saw that this was not a, this was not good for me, they stepped right into my business. They had no, and I'm so thankful at the time I was madder than a wet hen, (laughs) but I'm so thankful now because I can go back and see different people that I used to have, you know, interest in. And I'm very thankful that they did because I could have made a very big mistake. Not that those people were bad people, but where I was going in life and where they were going in life, you couldn't tell at that age because we were too close together. But where I wanted to go in life and have now, and where they wanted to go in life and have now, today we are miles apart. So young people, those people that are not married, listen to your parents. They are, they know your personality, they know your temperament. They have had a lot of years, a lot of wisdom. They have seen many things come and go while you were growing up and you should counsel them, ask them about this person. What do you think about this person? You know, you might have the person come over for dinner, talk to them, have the parents meet them, talk to them. But uh, yeah, this, this is an error, as she says, the, one of the greatest errors connected with the subject of marriage and uh, uh, courting marriage is the idea that the young and inexperienced must not have their affections disturbed, that there must be no interference. So parents uh, watch, and if you feel it's not appropriate, interfere. You know, they will thank you later for saving them from mistakes. If there ever were a subject that were needed to be viewed from every standpoint, it is this subject. The aid of experience of others and a calm, careful weighing of the matter on both sides, both the side of the young man, both the side of the young lady are positively essential. And if you are a couple and truly interested in each other, you should also want the best for them and recognize that even if there is a, you know, you go your separate ways, it's not that one person's bad or the other person's bad. It is what is, you want what's best for them and their happiness. She says it's a subject that's treated altogether too lightly by the majority of people. Take God into your counsel. Pray, 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 pray. Young friends, pray over the matter weigh every sentiment and watch every development of character in the one whom you think to link your life interest. It's so easy to be in a romantic involvement with somebody and you see these little things that they do and you, and you, your mind kind of flashes by, that's not good, but you think, oh, it's, it's okay. I'm not going to worry about it, you know, or, or I can, I can, change them later. No, pay attention to those little fleeting thoughts that go through your mind. Every examine carefully to see that, to see that life that will be happy happy and inharmonious and wretched. So examine the character of the person you're with carefully to see if the life of that person will be happy or inharmonious and wretched. Nobody goes, nobody gets married for the purpose of ending up like this. And that is why we need to be so careful. And you know what, here's the other thing too. You may see aspects of character in other people and think that's not a good thing. Remember too, as, as young people, we need to grow and mature and we need time to grow mature now when i was first married i was 25 years old my husband was 27 and we both agreed later on we were too young now physically we weren't we weren't too young obviously but we realized later on we were um too young emotionally or not too young 
we were still immature. <laughs> Even though, you know, I was out of college and working and so forth, there were still things that, see, I wish I had known, seen all this back then. There were things that we both, uh, if we had known, would have prepared ourselves before marriage for marriage. You know, and you say, well, like, like what? What are you talking about? Um, how to deal with finances. How to deal with conflict. How to, you know, this is my opinion. This is your opinion. How are we going to come together? Um, how to, you know, the children come and how are we going to take care of that child? How are we going to, there's, there's so many things, um, just managing the day-to-day -day aspects of life, uh, managing the household, who does the laundry, who does the cooking, who does the cleaning? Oh, that's her job. No, that's his job. You know, all these things. And the thing is with marriage is after you're married, you're only beginning. But there's a preparation that we do before marriage to prepare ourselves to be as knowledgeable and spiritually grounded as possible. But once you say I do, then there's a whole world of knowledge that you're going to gain after you're married. And hopefully you will grow together and grow up together because yes, you do continue growing up after you're married. Um, so so the, the character aspect, people can change their characters. They can change their ways. And there's nice ways to help people, um, your spouse or partner to make changes. And there's not nice ways. And the not nice ways are not profitable. So there's, that's, that's dealing with conflict. How do you deal with conflict? Those are things to be talking about, um, things to consider. Let me jump, jump over here. How are we doing on time? Uh, let the questions be raised. Will this, will this union help me heavenward? Will it increase my love for God? Will it enlarge my sphere for usefulness in life? If you are a, a young lady or a young man and you were raised as an Adventist and you're thinking, well, I'll just, you know, I like Susie or Joe here and I'm, we'll, we'll get married and then I will convert them and then we'll work together for the Lord. That's, that's a big mistake. That's a big mistake. Don't ever think that you're going to convert somebody after you're married. It's a mistake to be, it's unequally yoked. It's forbidden from the Bible. You need to be equally yoked. Have you ever tried to, um, have you ever tried to do a three-legged race, maybe in school, where two people are standing side by side and you tie your two legs together the, they're touching each other as you're standing side by side and then you're to you're to try to run together or walk together then try to run together and then try to race against other people doing the same thing and when you first start out you're falling and you're laughing and you're you know trying to get in sync okay this is kind of like what marriage is like it's especially that first year that first year can be very difficult very hard because you're learning you're seeing now, you're seeing character aspects that you've never seen before in that other person. And they're seeing character aspects in you that they've never seen before. And you're trying to get this, you know, wheel that's supposed to run perfectly to, you know, go nice, smoothly and solidly. And yet you may feel like you're in a three-legged race where you're, you know, hobbling and falling down and getting back up. Um, that's why you want to be very careful before you get married to consider the character of that other person because a lot of things you'll know, but there are things you will not know. And, and once you're married, you don't just say, well, I'll do a do-over and go get a new one. No, God intends for you to be married for life unless other certain things happen. So it's very serious. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna keep moving because I'm running out of time here. Deceptive courtship. Let me just touch on this briefly. And I know um, Brother Pondy was mentioning this the other night. Deceptive courtships are not good. Here is a letter to a young man who is infatuated with the courtship, subject of courtship and ma marriage, whose principal purpose was to have his own way. Ladies, this is a red flag for you. If you're having to do things hidden, 
if you're having to, you know, you can't talk to them until late at night when everybody's asleep and you're texting. Um, this is not good. This is not a good way to proceed. What does she say here? This is from letter three, 1886. This is true. This is true of many of the youth today. In order to compass their ends, they will work in secrecy, acting a part that is not frank and open. If you're having to act in secrecy, there's something majorly wrong. And this is not the way to proceed for a courtship that leads to marriage. Um, by this course, they educate themselves to be untrue to those who love them most and are trying to be faithful guardians of them. If you're doing things in secret and your parents don't know, that's not good. Ask, stop and ask yourself, why am I doing this? Why am I holding this away from my parents? And if you know why, then think about that. That's, it. that's your conscience talking to you. Um, the marriages contracted under such influences are not according to the order of God. Any young man who would lead a daughter away from duty, who would confuse her ideas of God's plain and positive commands to obey and honor her parents, is not one who will be true to the marriage obligations. I remember when I was in my late teens, early 20s, there was a young man who would try to get me to do this. And that's when my parents stepped heavily into my business. And my mom wisely said, oh, no, 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 no. If he's trying to get you to disobey us, there's a major problem here. And uh, finally, that relationship ended mainly at my parents. But now I realize I see the wisdom in what they said. The Bible condemns every species of dishonesty and demands right doing in all things. He who makes the Bible the guide of his youth, the light of his path, will obey its teachings in all things. He will not transgress one jot or tittle of the law in order to carry out his will or accomplish his object to catch that girl, catch that guy even if he has to make any and every sacrifice in consequence, if he believes the Bible, and if, you, and if you're a Christian and you want a strong marriage, this is where you wanna be paying attention to. He knows the blessing of God will not rest upon him if he departs from the strict path of rectitude. Although he appears for a time to prosper, he will surely reap the fruits of his doings. So listen, listen, listen to your parents. And you know what? And other, other people, if, if you say, well, I know what my parents think already. Seek out, talk to other people that are older, who've been married for a long time, who have a, who you look up to, who you think, you know, I would like to have a marriage relationship like that couple. Go make friends with them. Go talk to them. Ask them questions. You may not feel comfortable asking your parents. Ask them questions get counsel from them. They're, they are a wonderful, you know, these older couples like you see in church or wherever, um, Christian, Christian couples, they are a wealth of resources and wealth of wisdom. And, you know, they aren't as invested in you as your parents are. So, you know, make sure it's up some upright couple, but talk to them too. The Bible, this, I never, now this, when I saw this, I never thought of this before. So I'm going to share this with you here. Thou shalt not steal. Say, so, wow, that's kind of interesting. The young man who makes the Bible his guide need not mistake the path of duty and safety. That blessed book will teach him to preserve his integri integrity of character, to be truthful and practice no deception. Thou shalt not steal was written by the finger of God upon the tables of stone. Yet, how much underhanded stealing of affections oops, is done and excused by finite beatings, beans. Have you ever thought of that as stealing? Something to think about. Okay, so deceptive courtships are not good. Let me continue on here. I'm just gonna, I wanna talk about um, a little bit about preparing oneself for courtship. 
And in addition to the, I'm going to share you with you my notes again, in the interest of time. Um, what does it mean to prepare? So I'm talking about even before you're courting, there's preparation. And I know people are anxious to court, you know, and, and you're anxious to maybe hear your loved ones say, well, we should be courting now. Hold off. If things seem to be going too fast, then they are. Hold off. It's not be realistic about what is required in marriage. This is not a time of playing house. My mom used to say that to me a lot of times. Now, don't be playing house. <laughs> don't, be, don't be toying with people's affections. You know, she used to give me lots of wisdom there. Deciding when to get married and who to marry will have an impact on you and your children in this world and the world to come. Even before courting, both young men and women should take time. You need that time. Take that time. You can never get it back. To prepare themselves as to the realities and roles responsibility and responsibilities of marriage. Not only between two individuals, but consider the impact on both families, on the children, and even on the community. If you're in a if you're in a bad marriage that is very volatile and disruptive, it doesn't affect just you and your children, it affects everybody around you. So in addition to preparing spiritually, which is the foundation, think about these, think about these things here. Um, I think I have more or less more every, elsewhere too. Have you finished your formal education? Are you grounded as a Christian and converted? It's not enough just to be have your, your, your name on the church books. Your name on the church books, as Mrs. White also says, will not get you into heaven. Your name has to be in the book of life in heaven and not blotted out. And, and you'll say, well, what does that mean? When you accept Christ as your savior, your name is then entered into the book of life in heaven. But that is subject to a investigation of your life. And that's this, what we're in right now, this investigative judgment period time, period of time. Do our, we profess to be followers of Christ, we profess to be Christians, but do our words reflect it? Do our actions reflect it? Do our activities reflect it? Are we so forth? So we need to be converted. The fat, if you want the fast track is you want to submit and surrender yourself to the Lord. I mean, for some people, this may take decades. If you say, we don't have much time left, I want to get on with things, that's where you have to do. Submit and, and be converted. And, um, and that's personal study. That's not listening to one sermon a week. Or, you know, it is a in personal investigation of your own time and energies into your spiritual life. Here's something, when you're thinking about getting married and you're anxious and like, oh, I know, I, you know, I'd like to sometime court somebody and, and get married, you know, all that anxious um, energy, positive energy there, put that into reading. It, this is how you can educate yourself and get wisdom and not make mistakes. So read these, these books, you can get them online, Adventist Home. Uh, counsels for the home, how to not make mistakes. Read this. Christ object lessons. This is a must. Christ, we've been studying this in our Zoom sessions, Christ object lessons. This is a book, um, very powerful. It talks about the different parables of Jesus. And as you study those parables of Jesus, you're going to find gemstones all through it on God's expectations for you that you will never realize he has for you. So you want to study Christ object lessons because those expectations are going to transfer if you continue to you know, progress in your Christian life and with your partner, those, um, in fact, read these with your friends. You know, when you're thinking about, I want to court, don't be courting, have a group, group um, meeting where you kind of get to know people, but you're not paired off and read through these together, discuss them together. You know, watch people, other people's reactions to these different things. That's a good way to get to know people. 
read Ministry of Healing. So much in there on marriage and courtship and steps to Christ. You say, oh, I've read that once before or I haven't read it. This is for your personal spiritual growth with Christ. And, you know, we refer back to this over and over again, steps to Christ. It helps you understand what your spiritual life should be. It's much more than just going to church once a week or maybe even just a going to a prayer service midweek. And then when you are prepared, when you are old enough, you finished your schooling, you've gotten those basic things out of the way, and you are courting somebody seriously, I would encourage you read these together. Talk about them. They will bring up issues that you never thought about before. Uh, first of all, don't be unequally yoked. I have a whole bunch of stuff on that for you. Do I know what to watch out as for warning signs before I ever start courting? Okay, here's a couple. If things are, if things seem to be going too fast and you think, oh, I'm not quite ready for that yet. Okay, that's a warning sign. You might just, you know, back off. You don't want things to progress too quickly. Don't let people pressure you. Ready for this yet. You know, it's, there's a, a lot of people in the world. You don't have to sell for the first person you've ever laid eyes on. Do you understand all the rules you'll fill, fill as a married person? Ladies, what, what, kind of, what, what kind of roles is that going to be? You're going to be the cook. You're going to be the home manager. You're going to be the mother. You're going to be the doctor. You're going to be the counselor. You're going to be the supporter. You're going to be the... Um, uh, procurement person purchasing things for the home. You're going to be the manager. You're going to be the the um, the nurturer of the home. Um, there are so many roles, ladies, that we have on us. Even before we think about working outside the home, your role as a lady, as a and when I was thinking about this years ago, I wrote down a list. I can't find it. I wish I could. I wrote down a list of all of the attributes that a man, that God expects a man to be when he gets married and lead a, and have a family. And I was thinking, and I wrote this long list down of, you know, what God's expectations are for the man. And I thought, you know what? The lady, the mom needs to know this before she even has a son. The mom needs to understand all these different roles that God intends for that baby, that baby boy before he's born, that she, that she needs to instill in him as he's growing. So, you know, if you have, if you think, oh, we'll just get married, we'll have a baby and it'll be nice. No, get your, um, go, if you can get any experience with um, early childhood education or, um, working with a family that's helping a family that has small children and raising small children and learn and, and reading um, child guidance. You know, we need to, there's so much we need to educate ourselves on ladies before we ever find out that we're pregnant. Because once you're pregnant, hormones go up and down <laughs> and um, you know, you're just holding on. And, and um, there's so much we have to do. There's so many roles, ladies, that we have as a wife and as a mother and as a helper and, and everything. So you need to understand those roles, think about them and get experience, you know, talking to people and involving yourself in things. Also think about this, am I humbled and willing to follow what God says? Wives, submit yourselves to your husbands. Hmm. You know, that's not a real popular statement to say anymore. What women can, women think, well, I get an education. I can go take care of myself. Um, yeah, I, I've, I've been there, but you know what? It doesn't work. You need the how the husband needs to be the house band around your family. And if you, so therefore before marriage, if you can't respect him and look at him 
as that role of somebody that you can submit yourself to. Now, that doesn't mean that you're being walked on like a carpet and so forth, but you are with him. You're seeking God, but he is also, um, he's responsible to God for your family. He's responsible to God for you and your entire family. And so together you need to seek God, but in the, in the order, the biblical order of things, the husband is accountable to God for his entire family. And so ladies, uh, if you want some background, originally Mrs. White said that there was no difference between Adam and Eve when he created them. But it was after because Eve sinned and she sinned first, that God said then, wives, you are now to submit yourselves to your husband. That's how it is. God said it. And that is, we just have to accept that and uh, pay attention to that. Submit yourselves to your husband. Listen to them. And of course they will. And of course, husbands, listen to your wives. They have intuition that you don't have. And wives, your men have, the men have intuition that you don't have. Together, you make a strong team. You know, if I'm holding on to a bar with one hand, hanging from a, you know, on a playground, hanging on with one hand, I'm not going to be very strong. But if I have two hands, like a husband and wife together, and I'm hanging on, I'm going to hang on for a whole lot longer than if just with one hand. But think about this. Are you ready to humble yourself? Do you respect this man that you're considering marrying? that you are willing to submit yourself to him. And what I would suggest, ladies, this is from a lady to lady ask, uh, communication here. You wanna find a man who is spiritually even stronger than you, ground, more, more well-grounded than you. And likewise, gentlemen, when you're talking to young ladies and you are getting to know them, consider this, heaven forbid, something should happen to you and she is left raising children on her own is she spiritually grounded enough to where she will raise your children up as christians the way you would want them to be raised up i mean you know for you know if something happened and you passed away think about that would this young lady with what i know of her now and where she's going spiritually in her life would she be strong enough to raise my children the way I would want them to be raised, whether I'm, if I'm, you know, pass away or something? Very, that's so important to think about. Unfortunately, things happen like that. Something to consider. Um, let's see. Also, what livelihood and skills will I bring to the marriage so that we're self-sufficient? We shouldn't expect to get married and then just live, live in our parents' um, back room. If we're mature enough to be married, and then we're mature enough to be self-sufficient. And if we're not ready to be self-sufficient, then maybe we shouldn't be married yet. We need to get that education, get, our, get ourselves established. One thing my mom told me wisely uh, before I ever got married or she told me, as I grew up, she told me this. She said, now, Allison, before you get married, you finish your education. It wasn't if, it was you will. <laughs> and I did. And she said, now, and she says, and make sure you live on your own for one year. Where you are self-sufficient, you are supporting yourself for at least one year. And I took her advice. I knew she had a lot of wisdom and I did it. And I'm glad I did it. Because I had to learn how to manage my money by myself. I had to learn how to you know, manage my, my little, I had one, one bedroom apartment, manage my, manage my household, manage the cleaning, the cleaning, the cooking, the laundry, the car maintenance, the um, bills to come in, the work that I was doing. It, it was a lot. It was, it was a lot, but I'm glad I had that experience. She says, you need to have that experience before you get married, because when you get married, then there's two of you. home management, the finances, um, raising skills, working so that your family would not be left in poverty. What skills, knowledge and skills, domestic life, 
uh, you know, this is sometimes stuff we're working on all our lives to perfect, but cleaning, organizing, um, you know, what to, what to buy, what to keep, what to throw out, you know, clutter can happen very quickly and it can, and uh, there is a saying that says less is more. And, uh, you know, sometimes we are, we are raised in, in families where, you know, we accumulate everything from, from our parents, our grandparents and our aunts and uncles maybe that deceased and we get all their stuff. That's not good. Too much stuff is, is clutter for the mind. And uh, if your house is too cluttered, it's going to affect the peace in your home. And so especially now in these days, last days of minimal, last days preparing for Jesus coming when we know that, um, you know, eventually we'll be, you know, fleeing out into the woods or whatever, when they were being persecuted, can't take all that with you. Think about, think about this too. Remember the vision of Mrs. White that she had, where she's, I think this is in, you'll probably see it in early writings, where they're going up that, that uh, narrow path, going up that mountain. And I'm, I'm sure you've all seen this picture. And they have their, their, um, they're on their carts with their animals, their horses and so forth. And it's all laid down with all kinds of stuff. And as they progress on that path, going up that mountain, in, in her vision, what are they doing? They're let going of things. They're, you know, dumping their belongings over the side. Finally, they let go of the carriage and they just go on horseback. And as they continue progressing, they finally have to let go of the horse and they continue on foot and they keep progressing towards the heavenly city. And, and then at some point in time, they start, they have to take off their shoes and they take off their socks and they keep progressing. And this is the spiritual path and even physical path um, that we will have to go through between now and going and when Jesus comes, which we know is gonna be very soon. So even for those of you that are married, that have you know been married and if you've accumulated a lot of things, you know, it might be time to start thinking about uh, downsizing about minimizing your, your belongings, about if you had to leave in the middle of the night, what would you take with you? This is, and I don't speak, I don't just say this out of, you know, theory. I've done this. I have gone down from two houses down to living in a very minimalistic um, place now where we only have the very basic minimum, minimal things that we need. And you know what? It, it forces you to look, in your, it, look at your life with all the stuff around you. What's most important in my life? Is it all of my sewing stuff? Is it my you know, cra arts and crafts stuff? Is it my you know, artsy stuff? Is it my music stuff? When I was forced to do this, and I did, and it was you know, so many years ago, um, what it boiled down to, I had to think about what is the most important things. And it was the most important things is, you know, roof over the head, food, clothing, shelter, and my spiritual life was most important. Everything else had to be left behind. So think about that. Um, so think about these things. Are, am I ready? Resist the pressure of now this is my comment this isn't from mrs white but this is my comment because i saw this happen to people that i knew when i was uh young and in my teens there was this resisting the pressure of others to get married don't allow yourself to feel pressure to get married because everyone around you is doing it Seek the advice of those older and wiser on how to prepare yourself for a future marriage partner, as well as how to be parents of children and, the, and that next generation. There is no competition to get married. Satan will tempt many in this area and when rushed into, will leave many lives in distress after unwise marriages have been performed while being too hasty. I remember when I was in academy, there was there were a number of people who were, you know, right after they right after they graduated, they got married just like that. And a few are still married to this day. God bless them. 
Many are not. Many now are, have broken homes and their children grew up with separated parents in different households. And there was the saying, now I, in my, here where I was, and I don't know about when your country, but there was a saying, I remember when I was like 16, 17, that if you're not married by the time you're 20, you're an old maid and you'll never get married. That is wrong. <laughs> that is wrong. That's why I'm bringing this out. Resist the pressure. You know, even if you see five of your friends getting married and you're thinking, oh, well, what's wrong with me? I need to, I need to find somebody quick. So, cause I don't want to be left behind or looked at as being weird or, or, or lose my friends and resist that pressure. You need to prepare yourself. They may not be married in five years. Resist that pressure. Know yourself first and grow in Christ. Your first obligation is to God and preparing yourself for eternal life. Any one of us, if that is the, the most important thing that you can do. Um, any of us could be gone tomorrow. And if our lives are not secure in Christ now and for eternity, it doesn't matter, you know, about these other, other relationships. This is your first obligation. Confess and repent your sins. We should all be doing this anyway. Surrender yourself to God and consecrate him, yourself to him daily. Read steps to Christ on the consecration. Each morning when you wake up, we should be saying, Lord, I put myself in your will. Show me, guide me what to do today. Remind me when I run across different people to somehow bring up the conversation of things of eternity so that I can witness to them. We're accountable for those opportunities that we miss. Consecrate himself daily that he may be actively working in your life and guiding your path and opening doors for you. Learn, again, understand what, it, what we need, the need for a pure life and sanctification. Start learning how important a character that reflects Christ must be ours as well through a total transformation. Remember the words of King David. Create in me a clean heart, O Lord, and restore a right spirit in me. When this happens, you may, you may uh, be of a temperament where you might get upset easily or, or, you know, respond harshly and then later regret it. But you know what? All of those, and you see those characteristics in people, um, those are signs that they need to be, go through, be going through sanctification. They need to be surrendering themselves to Christ and asking for him to take out their carnal, our carnal hearts and replacing our hearts with Christ's heart. Because once that happens, then your, re, your normal reactions that you may have, the people that you know, trigger you are going to change. That's what meekness is. Meekness is a, a God-given ability to control your responses and your reactions to um, situations that can be kind of volatile for you or cause you to respond in a way that's not Christ-like. So that's a good prayer for all the time. Learn what's needed to receive the seal of God. That'll impact your character. That'll impact your life. That'll impact who you are choosing to spend your life with or if you're married read that anyway because that is how our families need to come together understanding this chapter five about testimonies volume five what is required to receive the seal of god if we don't pursue this we will by default end up with the mark of the beast not everyone who says lord lord will be saved so study the testimonies Daily personal Bible study and prayer will help keep that heavenly golden oil flowing as with the five virgins. If you see my Facebook page, you're going to see right now I have on the picture these two um, uh, trees that are golden and there's pipes coming out of them into a golden bowl with seven lamps on them. It's on a candlestick that comes from Zechariah 5, I believe it is. But that is our connection. That is the Old and New Testament, the, um, the true witnesses. And that 
heavenly oil that you need to keep in your lamps, keep in your, in your soul burning comes from that Bible study and daily prayer. We have to have it coming. The five foolish virgins, what was different? They didn't have the oil. They weren't doing this. They weren't studying. They weren't going up that path. Like I was telling you about the, with Mrs. White of the horses that they had to let go of the horses and all their belongings. They weren't going through the path of sanctification. So that's what we need to be doing. Again, read these books. Each of us needs to understand God's expectations and requirements of us as an adult. That's why it's, uh, Christ Object Lessons is so important, and in addition to the Bible. But Christ Object Lessons I like because it brings things practically, helps you understand things tangibly. It's something I can do tomorrow, something I can do the next day. Read the test, study the testimonies of Mrs. White. Um, not given when Jesus comes. Oh, character. There are some people who believe that the character will be given to you when Jesus comes. So that now we just only have to believe and the character will be a righteous character will be just, you know, downloaded to us when Jesus comes. That is not true. That character he leaves with us to work on now. That's in Christ object lessons that that is stated. God gives us talents and he gives us gifts. And we develop the fruits of the spirit and we're given those as we as we progress but we're not given a pure character so we're supposed to seek this and that's why you need a spiritual discernment so that you can understand your character where you need to make changes and ask the lord to help you do that Consider your preparation level, your preparation level thus far to meet the roles and responsibilities as a married man or woman. We talked about this a little bit already. Start and keep a journal. Now, I, I, this is now this is my comments here, and I'll just uh, share with you what I was thinking here. You know, before you're actually courting somebody, uh, you know, and you're you're meeting with friends, you're meeting in groups, and getting to know people. These are some things you might think about to write in your journal. What do you like and dislike about those around you? It helps to write things down. And, you know, you may have just come from a youth outing or something like that. And, and you get home and you're thinking about all the things that happened. Write down things I liked that happened, things I didn't like, behaviors you liked, behaviors you didn't like. Uh, draft, here's something else to, I, an idea for you for a journal. Draft a list of what you would like in a future spouse. Um, my husband actually did that. And he showed it to me after we were married. And I was, and he prayed about it a lot. And I was shocked. <laughs> um, I think he had like 20 characteristics he was looking for. And he prayed about them. And I think I met all of them except one. And uh, we have both been praying intensely. But yeah, write, write down a list of what you would like in a future spouse. Quantify it. You know, um, write down what you envision your adult look life to look like. You know, my son told me the other day, <laughs> or recently, he said, well, mom, I want to get married. I want to have eight kids. I said, really? <laughs> he says, but I keep telling girls that and they freak out and they get upset. He says, so I've compromised. I've changed it to four, four girls, four children. I said, oh, okay. Well, he has some growing and maturing to do. <laughs> but um, think about what you want your future life to look like and but be realistic and, and share that with somebody when you finally are courting. Uh, Describe the home you would look like to have, where you would like to live, what you would like to do for work. You know, sometimes people rush into marriage so quickly, they haven't thought about those things and they get married. And she says, I want to live near the city. And he says, but no, we need to live near, we need to live in the country because, you know, the spirit of prophecy advises that. Well, you've got a problem. He wants to live in the country. She wants to live in the city. Now what? So think about what you, how you envision your life and, and you have these things written down 
and you can talk about these with somebody. Um, think about what about work? Is your work going to control your uh, marriage? Is it going to control your spiritual life? Um, you know, lots of, lots of work can, uh, you may not have a choice as to where, whether or not to work on Sabbath. Well, you need to decide uh, whether you're going to do that and break the Sabbath, or you're going to find a different line of work. And I would suggest not breaking the Sabbath. God will honor those who honor him. Um, one thing regarding the Sabbath that comes up a lot of times, people say, well, I've got to work because I got to feed my family and, and they want me to work on Sabbath. He, I'll tell you something. Here's how I've always handled that myself. When I've gone to a employer and I wanted to, to work and I knew that subject was going to come up about the Sabbath, what I've always told them, you know what, and, and it has always worked out. I have not been denied a job because of it. Um, but what I told them is, is I cannot work Friday night through Saturday night because of my Sabbath. But in exchange of telling them that, I also followed up and told them, but I am willing to work on Sundays. And if you want me to work Sunday through Thursday, I'll be happy to do that or whenever, you know, it, it, as I, I was able to. Sometimes with children, you can't always do that. But I always told them I was willing to work on Sundays. And you know what? The employer was happy to hear that because they have a hard time getting people work on Sundays. They have a much easier time to get people to work on Sabbaths. So when I would tell them that, they would say, oh, really? Okay, well, we'll do that. And, uh, and so I did oftentimes. The nice thing about working Sunday through Thursday, guess what? You have Friday off for preparation day. So just keep that in mind if you're in that situation where you're trying to think about um, about that for Sabbath, about Sabbath work. Okay, let's let's go on here. Oh, I have some I have counsels for courtship and I have behavior conduct in marriage, and I have five minutes left. So mm, I might have to continue. Uh, pick up with that tomorrow in addition because we did talk about preparing for marriage today so maybe I'll continue on with that because there is a lot of I, I just want to show you this here there is a lot of counsel that I have here to share with you um, on the subject of being unequally yoked as well as on the subject of courtship from the spirit of prophecy these are search studies that uh we do and i can share these with you if they're interested this one's like 53 pages and what they are is their statements here about courtship and there's a number of them that i have to share with you but i'm kind of running out of time so i will pick up with those uh tomorrow when we meet so um yeah that's kind of we didn't talk about character traits, but uh, so much there's so much to share with you, and uh, and let and let it be known too that if people are interested in more information, I'm more than happy to do additional Zoom sessions um, on some of these topics that we're having to just kind of quickly skip over because there's more to talk about. But uh, I know we we're supposed to do a Q and A, and I've talked all this time. So in the last few minutes, uh, I'm just gonna go ahead and open up the um, board here. If people have questions they would like to ask, uh, I'll do my best to try to answer. I don't profess to know everything, but um, maybe I can help. And because I know um, Brother uh, Pondy said something. Let's see. Um, Okay, we do the Q&A after that. All right, so let's, let's go ahead and close with a word of prayer. And for those of you who are interested in doing some questions and answers, um, I'll be happy to do that. Again, for me, it's only one o'clock in the afternoon, so I can be here for a while longer. Um, bow our heads and uh, close out with prayer, and then we can continue on for those who desire to do so. Let's bow our heads. Dear Father in heaven, there's, we are so honored and so grateful to you that you have given us 
all of this information from the Bible, from the spirit of prophecy on guidance and how to live our lives, how to prepare our lives. And Lord, we know that the devil is around every corner trying to derail us. Father, I ask that as we are, as we close out this session tonight, that this, that help people to remember these principles. And if they need review, that they can come back and still ask me again. But Lord, I just ask for your blessing upon each and every person that is listening to this uh, broadcast today or in the future, that you will be with them to remind them to seek your help in all of these major decisions that we make in our lives and to guide our footsteps and remember that we are so close to the very end. We don't want to be derailed from your path and doing your will at this time. And so please thank you for your Sabbath hours that we have now to go into. We ask for a special blessing on everybody during the Sabbath hours and may we stay faithful, consecrated and devoted to you. And may we honor you as your representatives to the world. I pray this all in Jesus most holy name, amen.